A lot of my work in this field is related to visualizing uh, data, visualizing social networks, and looking at how people understand uh, their own social world when visualized uh, as a sort of a graph or a series of dots and lines or some other representation where you can take upwards of five, six hundred people, put them all on the screen together and make it make sense for somebody uh, as a set of their Facebook friends. Oh, a lot of... Well, a lot of network analysis actually takes place behind the scenes in the development of algorithms. So this would be how do you determine, um, say, how would Facebook determine which stories to show first? Or how would LinkedIn determine which um, sort of information to send you and which contacts to remind you of? Uh, and so a lot of that is, I mean, it's not so much a Rolodex in the sense of for a, uh, helping an individual in their, with their address book, typically, but it's more about helping these large platforms manage information more effectively. Now my work is a little bit uh, a little bit different from that in that it's not so much on the back end with the algorithms, but it is on that front end uh, helping people uh, kind of, yeah, manage those contacts. Maybe it is like a Rolodex. <laughs> my work was primarily in network visualization as a sort of a general or broad task, right? It doesn't matter doing it with, uh, you know, with the elderly or with high school people or with middle-aged people. Um, yet, it turns out that uh, this work was a very, of great interest to people on uh, young gay men in uh, Northwestern. And so I start collaborating with them actually on uh, developing software for uh, collecting network data in public health. And <laughs> a lot of things that uh, were sort of more cultural or identity based, now all of a sudden actually are brought to bear in the development of these technologies and the sort of considerations we have for how to um, help people with disclosure. And it's now it's just nice to see work that's coming out of a, uh, um, a center, an institute, not just the Oxford Internet Institute, but also the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing. <laughs> that's a, it's a mouthful. Uh, but work that's sort of like technically cutting edge, but yet focused on uh, sexual and gender minority health issues. I was, uh, so I was an innovator of two particular uh, techniques. One is um, a uh, pen and paper based technique for collecting a social network. We originally, we tried, um, 15 years ago by developing an app to do this stuff and it, it really fell on its face. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I was keen, I'm, a, I'm here, I'm going to program something in Java or some new web framework. Like, no, we just pen and paper. Uh, and then we actually do a bunch of technical coding in the lab, but in the field, uh, pen and paper. So we, we published this technique. And it gets picked up by these people in Chicago and they start using it themselves. Uh, then they are doing a different um, uh, project and they're, they want to visualize people's social networks. Uh, again, uh, young gay men and they're looking at whether, if they're out or not, uh, the difference in their, their social networks. Do people who are in the closet, are their networks smaller or more fragmented? And uh, as it turns out, more fragmented. Um, but they did that uh, using uh, another of my tools. Um, so they're like, well, we use this one tool by this guy, and then we use this other tool. Maybe we should get in contact with them. <laughs> and so they get in contact with me, and they say, well, we're doing this major project. It's a longitudinal project on uh, uh, sexual health. We're going to link together. Um, we're going to link together this uh, phylogenetic data, which is like actual gene sequencing of the HIV virus, with contact data uh, that we get from this massive network survey that we're going to do. But how are we going to do this network survey? Uh, it just almost seems too complex to do uh, with what we want. Can you help us out? <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, I don't really have anything, but I do have a graduate student. <laughs> and uh, he's really talented and he needs, uh, he needs collaborators. So that, just a series of opportunities, one led to the other. You seize these opportunities, uh, help out those around you, and things happen. I took one of my first dates to a computer science mixer. <laughs> and so, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like openly homophobic. It just felt somewhat, uh, for me, somewhat alienating. Um, so if you're someone who, um, if you're someone who's difficult with labels, someone who perhaps prefers uh, 
a label of queer or a gender, uh, then depending on the field you're in, people may not appreciate that level of ambiguity. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, I've met, in my education, I've in fact perhaps met more uh, sort of lesbians, trans people, through computer science, then through social sciences, now reflecting on it. Uh, the first trans person I ever met was a, uh, was a coder at um, uh, Microsoft Research when I, was in, uh, when I was in Redmond, and she was a, a brilliant uh, visualization specialist, well, she still is, <laughs> a brilliant visualization specialist. Uh, and so actually the only time I ever marched in a pride parade, it's an odd fact, <laughs> was in Seattle with Microsoft, <laughs> of all things. And this was actually after, uh, after this lady, uh, after Gina, she, uh, yeah, she gave me like a sticker, told me about Gleam, the gay and lesbian employees at Microsoft, and uh, yeah, I marched in the Pride Parade, I had great fun. I don't like the idea of, uh, say, Pride, Pride celebrations being like a memorial. And I'm of an age uh, where, certainly in the 90s, uh, a lot of gay celebrations felt that way. Um, nevertheless, progress didn't happen in the sweetest of ways, and it's important to uh, remember that and to remember that there were there were sacrifices that happened. As to, you have to acknowledge that these sacrifices happen so that people can feel themselves, and that what we're doing is kind of uh, expressing that. We're expressing this sense. Uh, that sacrifices have happened and you can feel more comfortable uh, in all sorts of mundane ways. I mean, we may not assume uh, that there's much related to a person's uh, 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 gender identity or sexuality that you would put into work if the work is, you know, if it's on physics, we're just looking at a coefficient here, but we're still human. <laughs> and. If you can't talk about the fact that maybe your, you know, your partner's unwell and you've got to go to the hospital, um, you, that becomes noise. It becomes noise. It's harder to think. It's harder to do great work, and it's harder to advance the field. Uh, the more that you can feel comfortable in your own skin, uh, the more I think you can, uh, uh, you know, excel at uh, at your work and feel confident in it. And feel like I'm doing a good job. I mean, certainly, I think it's uh, important to. Uh, celebrate and to acknowledge uh, the work of people from the sexual and gender minority in a variety of fields, uh, certainly in places where we might not think of visibility for them. Uh, particularly in my field, uh, I mean it's hard to overestimate the work of Alan Turing and it's also hard to overestimate the tragedy of what happened you know 60 odd years ago and how we were uh, gay men were treated uh, then. So I guess in, in recognizing some of these contributions, uh, it doesn't really repair the past, but it certainly uh, helps us feel like these contributions were valued and the people that made them uh, were valued. And certainly moving forward, that's important, especially for younger people. Uh, but there's still an awful lot of progress to be made, particularly for um, uh, people in the gender minority, uh, trans persons now are uh, experiencing still considerable difficulties in representation and, and understanding. In a social science field or arts and humanities, these things might come up in class. Uh, in, in STEM, they don't. You know, people are rarely talking about gender performativity in your, you know, sort of algorithms class. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily easy to feel represented, um, especially for women, and uh, within computer science this is a, you know, it's very lopsided, uh, the gender balance is very lopsided. So being able to highlight these sorts of inequalities is not just a, you know, it's not just about, hey, look at the contributions in the past, but saying that people should feel welcome in these fields and that they're, uh, that they're a part of it. It's, I think it's, it's not that hard to uh, meet people here. You know, like, 
I remember two years ago when the shooting in Orlando happened at Pulse, and uh, my favorite bar, uh, the White Rabbit, is not a gay bar, uh, you know, almost immediately put up a, uh, a rainbow pride flag inside in, in solidarity. And, you know, they had it up a few months later, and I said, like, you guys still want to keep that flag up? People look by, people go by and like they turn their nose up. And uh, one of the chaps at the bar said, if they don't want to be here because of that pride flag, well, we don't want them. It is a very good outcome here, and it is very supportive here. Um, that is, I mean, it's one of the reasons I, I am here, and I, uh, and I'm still here. I love the mental clarity of not having to worry about this stuff. You know, I can go into London and go to one of the world's, you know, most vibrant gay and lesbian communities uh, in the world, easily. Uh, every weekend, do what I want to do. I can, I can be here, do what I want to do, and again, I don't, I don't really need to, but I don't need to dwell upon it. I don't need to worry about what's happening behind the next corner or if colleagues are um, sneering at me behind my back for being gay. It's like that doesn't, that doesn't happen here, and so it facilitates, yeah, just a kind of a peace of mind that allows me to, you know, just do my work and hopefully do good at it. As the, um, as the world has become more liberal in its attitudes towards members of the sexual and gender minority, particularly the, uh, the Western world, uh, you get these questions about like, well, what do they need pride for anyway? Can't they just get on with their day? They, can't they just get on with their day and do their things just like every other normal person? And that's, uh, no, <laughs> no. They can enjoy themselves and be who they want. And part of the, part of the, fun, the joy of pride and pride celebrations is expressing a level of comfort with oneself that may be a little out of the mainstream and, uh, and appreciating that. That, it's, that. that it gives people license to feel comfortable in their own skin. Uh, it's motivated by some of the you know, struggles of the past. Everything from the persecution of gays to, uh, to HIV to the current sort of violence against trans persons, you know, these are, uh, these issues motivate this. But, you know, the, uh, the carrot to the stick, if you will, is that it's, it's supposed to be about joy. I mean, this is about people, A, feeling comfortable in their own skin, and B, loving who they want to love. I mean, this is not a, it's not a downer of a topic, and it's not something that should be tone policed. <laughs> it's something that should be uh, should be cherished. And it's not just for the um, sexual and gender minority. Uh, everybody can get in on this. I mean, I certainly remember in Canada uh, that this feeling, this sense of pride, it's not like gay pride anymore, it's just pride. Um, uh, everyone has their own struggles. And sometimes we can celebrate who we have become because of those struggles and that it's, you know, it's not just made us stronger in some sort of tragic way, it's just made us more interesting. <laughs> and, you know, show it off. <laughs>